Amen. Beautiful song, young ladies. Beautiful message in that song as well. As long as you can detect the holding of his hand, you'll never have to worry. you never have to be afraid. Some of you, you're afraid because you can't feel the hand. You can't hear the voice. You can't see the face. And if you're lost, you can't hear and feel and see any of those things. I encourage you, if you can't feel it, if you can't hear it, you can't see it, you might want to look inside your heart. See exactly where you're standing with the Lord is. It might be you need to get saved this morning. I don't know what it is that God has for us this morning. I do know this. Let's start by turning over to Acts chapter number 16. Always very thankful to get the opportunity to stand and to preach, especially here in chapel. I like the feeling of chapel because when you're preaching in an actual service, you're, you're preaching to a lot of adults, and certainly we have plenty of adults in here today. We're thankful that you're here, taking time out of your schedule to be here with us. But I've always enjoyed preaching God's Word to kids. I enjoy that because as you get older, generally your, your, your faith isn't quite what it used to be. The Bible talks about a childlike faith. And there's something very precious and very special about the faith that you have as a child. To the point where God would that all adults go back to that childhood faith in order for them to get saved. So that they can trust Christ. You have that faith. You don't have to go back in life. You don't have to go back in time. You are there. You're at a very influential point in your life and in your development. Don't waste it. Don't take advantage of it. Don't, don't allow the devil to squander this time that you have. He would like nothing more. We're going to talk, though, for just a few moments this morning about a story in the Bible that I enjoy going back to. I enjoy going back to it because it has to do with singing. I enjoy singing. I know you do as well. That's why we have a large portion of our chapel service as singing. I enjoy singing the fun songs. I enjoy singing the songs of the, the hymnal. I just like singing. I like singing so much that people probably have to tell me to stop every once in a while. And it's just because I have a song in my heart. And it's sometimes you wake up and you got a song. You wake up from your bed and all of a sudden you have a song in your mind. And you're, you're in the shower or you're getting ready in that morning. And, and you're just thinking about this song. And, and it becomes what's, what's called in music an earworm. Anybody know, you're familiar with the term earworm? Earworm? It's like if you've got a worm in your ear, right? And it just keeps swirling around and swirling around. You can't get it out. A lot of music is like that. It becomes an earworm. Once you hear it, you start going over and playing it and playing it and playing it. One of my favorite things about working with Brother Leader is that I can easily get a song stuck in his head and it's there for the rest of the day. It's hilarious. I don't have to sing but two measures of it and the rest of the day he's humming that song, he's singing that song. I love picking on him that way. But having a song, and we're going to find in this story that there was a song in the most unlikely of places. A place where we would say there is no reason to sing, no cause to sing. And yet, the song changed everything in the moment. Acts chapter number 16, are you there? Wonderful. Acts chapter number 16. For sake of time, we'll read the entire thing. Um, no, we'll start at verse number 19. I'll allow you to be seated because of the lengthy passage we're about to read. Starting in verse number 19, the Bible says, And when her masters, this is talking about a, a servant girl, a slave girl really, who was being used and she was possessed of a devil. Obviously, she meets uh, Paul and Silas, and they were able to cast that spirit out of her. This follows that. Verse number 19, And when the, her master saw that the hopes of their gains were gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace unto the rulers, and brought them to the magistrates, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city. And teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe being Romans. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison awakening out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. 
Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. For a few moments this morning, I just want to preach on this simple thought. Singing through your suffering. Singing through your suffering. Let's pray. Our Father, Father, you know... You know what you're doing. And Lord, there's been many times where I've questioned if this is exactly the right message for the hour. Lord, I'm looking at a sea of faces, and Lord, I can't see what's behind these faces. I don't know what's going on in their hearts. I don't know what's going on in their lives. I'd like to think that most everybody in here is not going through a time of suffering, but there might be somebody in here that is. I pray, Lord, that every word that comes out of my mouth would be hidden behind the cross. I pray that they would be the words that you would desire of me to speak. I pray that you'd help us to listen, to learn, to have open ears and open hearts for what you would have us to know this morning. As we preach your word, Lord, may you fill this place with your spirits. I pray, Lord, that you get all the honor, praise, and glory for everything said and done in here. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Have you ever had a bad day? You might be in here today and you say, Brother Caleb, I had a bad day already this week. (laughs) I've had a bad day already this year. And we're only one month into the year. It's now February. We're only one month in. How many of you would raise your hand and say, Brother Caleb, this year, 2024, I've already had a bad day? Really? Way more hands than I was expecting this morning. You know what kind of a day I'm talking about, don't you? I'm talking about the kind of day that just starts off bad. It starts off and and you get up and maybe you woke up late or maybe you hit your snooze button once too often and and now you're running late and you don't have time to eat your fruity pebbles or you don't have time to eat your lucky charms or you don't have time to to, to do all the things you'd like to in the morning. So you're running late, you're running behind and, and all of a sudden you get to school and you're running late, you're five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes late for school and you realize you have a test. You didn't know about this test. It completely forgot, it completely slipped your mind. You didn't prepare, you didn't study, you didn't do anything, and you're dropped right into the middle of this test. You do your best looking at these questions. And of course, when you forget a test, it's never the, the connect the dots. It's never the, it's never the fill in the, it's never the, uh, the, the multiple choice. It's always fill in the blank. It's always long form answers. It's always things that you have to know. You cannot rely on just circling the right answer. So you go into class and that happens and you go to lunch and somewhere about lunch someone gets the cutting up and and something spills all over you and now your clothes are all messy and you have to deal with that for the rest of the day. And then you you go out to recess and you injure yourself at recess and and then you go out go go back to class with your with your clothes smelling like your food from lunch and with your 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 broken broken arm or broken face or whatever it is you broke at recess. And then you go home and you go home you step out of the car and a, a, a rabid dog comes along and bites your ankles. Now you have rabies on top of all your other problems. And then you you try to do your homework that night and you get into a fight with your brother or sister. I know none of you fight with your siblings, but but maybe just for case of the sake of the story, you do fight with your brother or sister. And you go to bed wishing that you could have never gotten up that morning. You go to bed saying, I want to just crawl into a hole and pull the hole in after me. That's the kind of bad day that I'm talking about. You may have had a bad day. But in our worst of days, I would dare say that nothing that we have gone through compares to what Paul and Silas went through. We see here this whole situation gets started with them doing nothing wrong. They aren't guilty for their bad day. This isn't something they brought upon themselves by sinning or by doing the things of the world, the flesh, or the devil. How did this bad day start? Well, it started with people getting saved. For the later, that sounds like a pretty good day to me. It talks about Lydia getting saved and being able to cast out this demon from this demon-possessed girl. And, and all the things in this chapter are good things. Paul and Silas are probably excited. Praise the Lord that God allowed us to see someone saved this morning. And that, that God was able to ca- have us cast out this demon. She's going to no longer have to worry about that for the rest of her life. For she now has a different spirit living within her. They're excited. The people around aren't so excited. And they brought 
Paul and Silas before forward and they started making some charges against them. There were three types of charges that were brought up by way of introduction against Paul and Silas. If you're taking notes, three types of charges that they brought up against these two men of God who were doing, again, nothing wrong. The first thing we see is that it was a racist charge. It was. Look at verse number 20. These men being what? Jews. What are they saying? Oh, these Jews. It's their fault. It's them because of who they are. Wouldn't you, wouldn't you just see that as being atypical or being a typical thing of the world just to pull the race card? They did it on Paul and Silas. Don't think it's any new thing that people point the finger at you and say, ah, you're just a racist. You're just doing that because of your white privilege. You're just doing that because of your skin color. You're just doing this because of that, this, that, and the other. It didn't start in America, by the way. It's been going on for a long, long time. The Romans can take a little bit of credit for this one as well. They turned to them and say, these men being Jews. Can I remind you though this morning that God in the very, very beginning created but one race. He created Adam's race, which was a sinful race. And God looks down upon Adam's sinful race throughout the course of history and he says, I don't want my people to have to deal with Adam's race. They point to the Jews and say, you're, it's because of your race that you're this way. God points at his people and says, I'm not going to choose my race to, the, to, to divide. I want my race to unite. So instead of using my first Adam, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to send a second Adam. I'm going to send a second person who has a different lineage, who has a different bloodline, who has a different past, and I want my people to unite to that bloodline. We're seeing here those people, they're being racist against God's people. They're saying, these men being Jews, it was a racist charge. Can I also say this? It was a riotous charge. What did they accuse them of? These people being Jews do exceedingly trouble our city. It's interesting. What was it they did that was so awful? They evangelized the sinner. They evicted a bad spirit. They evaporated the soothsaying, and that's where their problem was. Oh, what happened to the money? The money that was coming in. We lost our profits. We lost our income. We lost our money maker. What are we going to do? And it came down to the money. I think it's interesting. The Bible talks about the love of money, doesn't it? It's the root of all evil. And as we see in this story, it was as well. It was a riotous charge. What did they do that was so wrong? Nothing. But can I say this? Where God sees triumph, the world sees trouble. When God starts moving, the world says, oh, you can't be doing that around here. I'm sorry, you, you can't be getting excited. Wait a minute, you're, you're, you got saved and now you're not going to the bar with us? What's wrong with you? You got saved and now you're not cussing like we are? What's wrong with you? You got saved and now you're, 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 you're just acting differently? You're thinking differently? You're going to church on Sundays? What's wrong with you? When the world sees God's triumph, they see it as trouble. But can I say this? That often it's the other way around as well. You see, it's not only about God's triumph where the world triumphs. You know what God sees? Trouble. Where the world flaunts itself and where the world sees, oh, we're making so much progress. That's the big word. It's progressive. We're making progress. This is a good thing. The God in heaven looks down and says, mm-mm, trouble. Trouble based on sin. We see it was, a, it was a racist charge in verse 20. We see it was a riotous charge in verse 20. I see number uh, letter C. It was a religious charge. And here's where the rubber meets the road. Oh, yes, they didn't like them because they were Jews. Oh, yes, they didn't like them because he took away their moneymaker. But can I say this? Verse number 21 says, And teaching customs which are not lawful for us to receive. You know what it really came down to? It came down to their faith. They didn't like them because of their faith. Oh, sure, the racist card, that was just on top of it all. Oh, yes, the soothsaying, oh, that was on top of it all. But what their really problem was, was with their faith. We shouldn't be uh, surprised about this because our faith is under attack as well, is it not? 
Wherever God's faith exists in the world, there will be attack upon it. Why? Because the world sees the light and they hate the light because their deeds are evil and they love the darkness. They hate the faith. They hate the light. They hate anything that is of God. And God even warns us about this in his word. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 3.12, Yea, and all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. The Bible says it is a promise. I have it highlighted in my Bible. I have a little P right, written right next to it. Why? Because that is a promise from the word of God. And Miss Emily, God can't lie. It is impossible for him to lie. So if that promise isn't true, then we could throw away the entire Bible and God no longer be, he ceases to be God and nothing that we have believed ever makes sense. If one promise is wrong, then we can throw it all out. But it's not wrong. Can I reverse engineer this though? That means that if you live godly, you shall suffer persecution, but it also means that if you're not suffering persecution, you might not be as godly as you think you are. The Bible says it for sure, shall suffer persecution, not might suffer, not may suffer, not it could happen or it couldn't happen. The Bible says all that live godly in Christ Jesus, according to God's standard of godliness, shall suffer persecution. So Billy Caleb, I've never suffered persecution. Well, that might be its own problem. Why? Because all, all, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall. It's a promise from scripture and it can be seen in our lives as well. That was the problem. Their problem was with the godly and it was a religious charge. Now that I've said all that, let me say this though. There were several things we see about their singing in the suffering. The story is surrounding their song and their song seems to be the crux, the very middle of it. But this song had a few things that I think uh, would warrant our attention this morning. The first is this, their song was burdened by pain. It was burdened by pain. It's impossible to see the story and not see the pain that it involved in God's people. You look over at verse number 22, and the Bible talks about the magistrates rending off their clothes, commanding to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who having such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. Can I say this is the world's way of shutting up the soul winner? The world wants nothing more than for the soul winners to be quiet. Stop talking. Stop knocking. Stop witnessing. Stop passing out gospel tracts. Just be quiet. Paul, Silas, stop talking. Stop preaching. Stop witnessing. Just be quiet. And when they wouldn't, this is what the world had to do. We see their shirts were rent. It was a public pain. It was public humiliation. A lot of people refused to go soul winning or refused to pass out gospel tracts because they wondered, what will people think of me? What if I get rejected? What if I don't have the answer and now I look dumb? Public humiliation. One of the greatest weapons that the devil uses to keep you from saying anything. Public humiliation. We see their shirts were rent. The strokes were ravaged. It was a personal pain. A personal pain that they really felt. The Roman government had men that were known as lictors. And these lictors carried out the duty of using a weapon known as a fasces. A fasces was simply a bundle of rods around an axe. An axe that had an actual axe head. The rods could be used for beating. The axe could be used for decapitating. This was to represent their corporal and capital punishment. These would have been the men who would have been called upon to beat Paul and Silas. And obviously it wasn't God's time for them to use the axe, but they did use the rods. It was a personal pain. Sometimes personal pain in your life can keep you from talking. Personal pain can keep you from witnessing. Personal pain can keep you from going out, oh, I just, I'm not feeling that well today, so I'm not going to go out and pass out tracts. Or I'm not feeling well today, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to tell my friends about Jesus. I'm, I'm not feeling well today. Pain, personal pain can stop someone from being a witness. The world tried to, sh to shut them up through a personal humiliation, through a public humiliation. We see the stripes that were ripped. There was a permanent pain as well. Whenever they were beaten, their stripes were not 
taken care of or, or used to be cleansed or tried to heal until later on, much, much later on in the early morning hours. We don't know what kind of infection may have set in during that time, but we do know this. Generally, people who received stripes in the Bible had a permanent scar, something they would hold on to for the rest of their life. There might be something you're holding on to. It would be a, a, a pain that happened a long, long time ago, but that is your excuse. That is your cudgel. That is the thing you say, oh, well, I can't serve God now because of what happened in my past. But that's not of God. God wants to take your past, use it in the present to change someone else's future. That's the God that I serve. There's a permanent pain that was there. Can I also say the stocks were required? It was a prison to pain. They said after it all was said and done, after they publicly humiliated them, after they personally beat them, after they permanently scarred their back, we're going to imprison Paul and Silas. I think about when I was a kid. How my parents, whenever I would do something wrong, and I know you never think that I did anything wrong. Bless your sweet heart. But I would do things wrong as a child, and as I would do it, my parents would often send me to my room even before they punished me. Why? Because they wanted me to think about what I've done. Maybe some of your parents have done that as well. They want you to think about it. They want you to sit in it. They want you to stew on it and meditate upon it. I think that's exactly what we're doing here for Paul and Silas. Throw them in prison with a broken and a bloody back. Throw them in prison with no clothes upon themselves. Let them think about what they've done. Again, the whole purpose of this was to shut them down. You know, we were, the world and the devil realizes that if he can shut you up, he has effectively shut you down. As a Christian, if he can shut you up, he shuts you down. How can he influence anybody? He can't talk to them. How is he going to reach a world that he never touches? The devil realizes if he can shut someone up, he can shut them down. God's given you a voice for a reason. Many people use their voices for wrong reasons. Pastor was touching on this last night about the words that we say. And on the tongue, it's a little member, but such a destructive and a dangerous member. But you can also use your tongue for good. God desires that you use your tongue and use it to uplift and use it to witness and use it to preach and use it to be a blessing to others and to edify. That's what God's talking about here. The devil saw the, all the potential of the tongue and he said, shut them down. It was, it was a, a very important thing. It was burdened by prayer. But can I say number two? It wasn't just burdened by prayer. It was also born or burdened by pain. It was, burned, it was born out of prayer. It was born out of prayer. Look at verse number 25. And at midnight, Paul and Silas, what? Prayed. They prayed. The Bible could have left this out, but it chose to leave it in. Because prayer is just as big as God is. Prayer is just as strong as God is strong. Prayer can reach as far as God can reach. Don't ever give up. Just pray. So you see, somewhere along the line, Paul and Silas learned this truth. And they realized in the middle of their pain, in the middle of this, this terrible situation, there's someone who can do something about it. And it's not them. They realize we, we're, we're in stocks here. We can't break out of this. We can't pick the lock. We can't get ourselves out of this prison. But we know someone who can. I like, as I read through scripture, talking about all the many times that prayer is referenced. You can go over to James chapter number 5, verse 13, where the Bible says, Is any among you afflicted? Paul, Silas, you afflicted right now? What does the Bible say? Let him pray. See, so many people, when they get afflicted, they turn away from God rather than turning to God. They make one of the biggest mistakes because they turn away from the only person who can do something about it. God's the only one who has the power to do it, which is why the Bible says, if any of you is afflicted, let him pray. Paul, later on in his life, writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy 2, 8, and says this, I will, that, therefore, that men pray everywhere. Was this Paul just saying, let, do as I say and not as I do? No. Paul exemplified this. He'd pray on the streets. He'd pray by the waterside. He would pray on the roads. And he would pray in the prisons. Paul said, I am not just telling you something to do. I'm showing you what I have personally done. Let me tell you about when Silas and I were in jail. You know what we did? We prayed. Because prayer works. We see here that it was born out of prayer. Have you ever wondered what they were praying for? 
There's many things they could have been praying for. They could have been praying for maybe the relief from their pain. I know I would have been. You have a bad pain that just won't go away? Man, you're praying so hard. God, take away the pain. God, show me what's wrong. Help me do something about it. A relief from the pain. Maybe they were praying for that. Maybe they were praying for a release from the prison. God, I don't want to be here anymore. And I don't understand why I'm here. It's dark and there's rats and there's disease and I, my back's bloodied. And, and Lord, release us. Get us out of here. Maybe they were praying for that. But perhaps they were also praying for the redemption of the people. You see, they were in the innermost prison. The Bible says that's where they were placed. I think it's interesting, Pastor, that they were placed right into the center of the prison. They didn't see themselves being in the center of the prison. They saw themselves as being in the center of God's will. You know, there's a lot of people around us over here. We can't have a, a, we can't have a, a waterside ministry anymore. That time has passed. We can't have an exorcism ministry anymore. That time has passed. But hey, maybe I can have a prison ministry. You know, maybe I can start witnessing to the people in here. Maybe there's a few prisoners that need a song. Maybe there's a few prisoners that need a prayer. Maybe there's a few prisoners that are lost and on their way to hell. And maybe God sent us right here, right now, for them. Maybe. Whatever it was that was born out of prayer. It was born out of prayer. It was burdened by pain. Number three, it blessed all the prisoners. Again, the Bible is so selective in what it says and what it doesn't say. And sometimes I read over and wonder, why was it so important that God wanted us to know this little tidbit? Verse number 25, and at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. And that's where the verse ends, right? And the prisoners heard them. You see, being in the center of the prison was in the center of God's will because they were equal, distant from every single person in there. They realized, we've got a great opportunity here. Just as Jesus would go out into the middle of a lake and allow his voice to carry evenly upon all the people that he would be preaching to, Paul and Silas realized, you know what? We're going to sing a little louder for the people in the back. We're going to go and shout a little bit louder for the people on that side. Hey, 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 prisoners over in the east wing, I want you to hear, my God is so great, so powerful, so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. Oh, they were blessing all the prisoners. They didn't see themselves in the middle of a prison. They saw themselves in the center of God's will. The best day of your Christian life is the day that you realize that God has everything under control. You see, they didn't, again, they realized that this wasn't just a happenstance. The Bible talks about, and Jesus taught this in Matthew chapter 10, are not two sparrows sold for a farthing, and one of them shall not fall to the ground without your father. He said if there's two sparrows over here, one of them going across the sky, he is not allowed to fall without God saying it's all right. And meanwhile, the very hairs of your head are numbered. Fear ye not, ye are more valuable, you have more value than many sparrows. God said this, if I control the sparrows, each individual one of them cannot do, cannot fall to the ground without me saying so, how much more am I in control of your life and your circumstances? You say, Brother Caleb, you don't know my life. And you're probably right. I don't know much about what's going on in your life. I do know this, though. Everything that has happened in your life has been allowed by the hand of God. Meaning that everything in your life has been first father filtered. And as God saw your life, he didn't see it as a mistake. He didn't see it as a happenstance. He saw it with purpose. And he cares so much about your life that he says, I know how many hairs are on your head. I know what you're doing, I know what your future is, and I have made you for a very specific purpose. Sometimes we forget about that. Sometimes we just think, oh, well, I'm just living my life. No, you're living a life that God has a purpose for. And your choices, both right and wrong, will have a big long-term effect on whether you reach that purpose or whether you don't. The decisions you make here in Christian school go a long way toward that purpose being accomplished and it not. 
Say, Brother Caleb, you don't know my life. I don't, but God does, and that's the only one that matters because God is the one in control. It blessed all the prisoners. Now, just like we don't know what their prayer was, we don't know what their song would have been like. I like to think, Brother Gene, it would have sounded something like, God never moves without purpose or plan. When trying his servants and molding a man, give thanks to the Lord, though your testing seems long. In darkness he giveth a song. And Silas starts remembering this as he learned this also as he grew up and, and, and he joins in on the chorus. Oh, rejoice in the Lord. He makes no mistakes. He knoweth the end of each path that I take. For when I am tried and purified, I shall come forth as gold. Maybe it was something like that. Maybe it was take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Maybe it was, the Lord giveth and taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I've served him before, and I'll serve him today. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Whatever they were singing, the people in that prison heard them. Can I tell you, it's very important. You don't realize what your song will do to someone who is lost on your, on your job sites. Maybe even to someone who's lost in your Christian school or in your, in your class. You don't know what your testimony is going to do, but it's important that they hear a person of God living with the life of God and the joy of God and the peace of God even in the middle of their trials. Why in the middle of your trials? Because anyone can fake it when things are good. Anyone can live joyfully when things are going their way. But when your back is bleeding and when your back is scarred and when you're in an unpositionable and un uncontrollable place and someone hears you singing the songs of Zion they realize something about you that they don't have in the middle of your suffering your testimony is the strongest number four not only was it burdened out of pain it was born out of prayer it blessed all the prisoners I like this it broke the prison it broke the prison Verse number 26, and suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all of the doors were open, and everyone's bands were loosed. Why did they pray? Why did they sing praises to God? Well, because God, according to Psalm, number, Psalm 22, verse 3, talks about him inhabiting the praise of his people. They say, you know what, if we want to get God in here, if we want to bring God into this place where he can break off these bands and he can open these doors, it's time to shout a little bit. It's time to sing a little bit. It's time to praise a little bit. And God's up in heaven with his ear bent down. Angels, you just, you just keep it quiet over there. Hey, hey, you guys over there with the instruments piped out a little bit. I've listened to something that sounds amazing down there in that prison. As God hears it, I like to think he gets a little excited about this. So that God's up in heaven. Woo! I like that. And as he starts stomping, and as he starts hollering and carrying on, the foundations begin to shake and the doors begin to break and the chains begin to fall away as God inhabited the praise of his people. Oh, what a time that must have been. I can't imagine being a lost person at that time. Maybe with a critical attitude thinking, oh, well, it's just all a show. It's just all them just trying to put on. They're just trying to be the good religious folks. We'll see how that turns out for them. And all of a sudden, they start feeling a rumble. The jingling of their chains just starts rattling a little bit, and they realize, oh, maybe there is something to this God thing. Maybe there is a God in heaven. Because I've been worshiping these pagan gods, and they haven't done anything like this. And I've been serving myself, and, and my flesh has never been able to do anything like this. And I've been out in the world, and the world's never been able to give me anything like this. God was showing his power, not just to Paul and Silas, but also to every prisoner that was in that prison that night. Can I say, when you start crying out to God in prayer and lifting up your voice in godly praise, you will get God's attention. But lastly, not only was it burdened by praying, it was born out of prayer, it, was blessed, it blessed all the prisoners, it broke the prison, but lastly, it benefited the preoccupied. You see, there was someone else in that prison that night that the Bible doesn't really talk about too much until this moment. 
Verse number 27, and the keeper of the prison, awakening out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice saying, do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Have you ever stopped to think about this, Brother Gross? There were a lot of lost prisoners in that prison that night, all of which had their doors opened, all of which had their bands loosed, all of which could have left. They could have. They could have walked right out the door. The Bible doesn't tell us exactly when this prison, this jailer, this keeper woke up. It says after all these things that he woke up. They might have had time where they could have escaped. But they didn't. Ever think about why, Brother Burner? Why wouldn't they have escaped? Why wouldn't they have taken their freedom when given the chance? Unless they thought there was something more valuable than their freedom that was still there in the prison. There was still something they didn't have, and they weren't leaving until they got it. Maybe it was those prisoners who realized, hey, we're all here. We can leave just as any time as we want to, but our physical freedom isn't as important as our spiritual freedom. The prisoners, they were all there. They didn't leave, though they could have. And the prison guard, as he rises in the night and maybe wipes the sleepiness out of his eyes, he realizes that he's in trouble. Until this point, he doesn't realize that all the people are still there. All he sees are doors that are open, and he sees his neck on the chopping block. He sees the lictors coming back, but not using the rods, and rather using the axe on him. And he sees that he is going to die one way or another. So he'd rather take his life under his own circumstances, under his own power. And he draws out his sword, desiring to plunge it into his own chest and take his own life. Can I say this? The thought to kill yourself never comes from God. The thought to kill yourself never comes from God. You see, if this jailer would have killed himself, what would have happened to him? He would have died and gone to hell. He is, he is lost at this point. We can tell that by the question he's about to ask Paul. He is a lost man. And the devil was, I'm sure, whispering into his ear. You might as well just end it. The Romans are going to do it later anyway. If you don't do it, they will. So why not spare them the trouble? Why not do it under your own terms? You just take your own life and end it all. That never comes from God. That only comes from the devil. You ever hear that whispering in your ear? You reject that. Put it away. Why? Because that is 100% out of the rotten pits of hell. But can I also say this? As he was about to take his own life and cast his eternity into the lake of fire, he had a soul winner. There was someone who cared enough for his soul that God had divinely placed into his path at the moment of death to interfere and with fear pull him out of the fire. Out of fear, pull him out of his eternal destiny. And Paul was able to lead that man to the Lord. Can I say, it wasn't just him. He pulled them out. He took them home. Where Paul and Silas witnessed to the entire family, and they all got saved. It wasn't just the jailer. It wasn't just the keeper. It was his entire family. And, And who knows what the ripple effect would have been amongst all the prisoners that heard it as well. All because that in the middle of their suffering, they said, I'm not going to give up my testimony. In the middle of my suffering. Hey, things might not be going so good for me right now, but I'm not going to let my circumstances determine my spirituality. I'm not going to let my current present state where things aren't going very well and things might be a little rough at home and things might be a little rough at school or might have a little conflict with my friends. I'm not going to let that determine what kind of a Christian I'm going to be and what kind of a leader I'm going to be and what kind of a man and what kind of a godly young lady I'm going to be. Because they didn't, they got the unique opportunity of reaching that lost jailer, reaching his entire family reaching probably even many of the prisoners. And Brother, Brother Berner just taught on this not too long ago in the book of Philippians about the church that was started there based on the people that had gotten saved in this chapter. All that could have been lost with the loss of their testimony. In conclusion, I'm just going to say this. Everyone under the sound of my voice falls into one of two categories. You're either lost 
like the jailer was. And the Bible says that your life is like a vapor. You don't know how much time you have left. The jailer thought, if I make it till morning, I'm going to die in the morning. Might as well take my life now. If you're lost and on your way to hell, can I remind you that there is a God who loves you, who sent his only son to die for you, so that you would not have to go to hell, but by trusting in him and what he did on the cross, you can be saved. If you're lost, this message is for you. Be saved. Experience the joy, the peace that you currently don't have. But everyone here is either the lost or the one to reach the lost. You might be in here and say, I'm saved. I got my fire insurance. I'm good to go. I'm not going to hell. Well, who has God called you to reach? You say, I, I, don't, I really don't know. I'm sure Paul and Silas didn't know either. They didn't know who that prayer was for. They didn't know who that song was for. They didn't know who they were there to reach. But God divinely in his plan put that person in their life that only they could reach. So I ask you a question. On your good days and bad days alike, do you see every person around you as a never dying soul who will spend eternity in heaven or hell? So often we forget that every single person that we run into in the school, in public, in our families is someone who's going to spend eternity in one of two places. But what if God has put you uniquely into your family to reach one of your family members? What if God has uniquely put you onto that block and that street that you're living on for that neighbor right across the street? What about God has maybe put you uniquely into this school with a classmate who isn't saved so that God can use you as a godly young person to lead your friend and classmate to the Lord? I don't know what God is desiring to do. I do know this. If we start seeing every single person around us as a never dying soul, it will affect the way that we live our, our Christian life as well. With every head bowed and every eye closed, no one looking around. How about you this morning? How about you? Are you singing in the midst of your suffering? Is there anything that you are doing that is defiling your testimony? What are you using as, as an excuse, young person, for being quiet? You see, the devil wants nothing more than for you to shut down, you to clam up. He doesn't want you seeing your opportunities. He wants you focused so much on your circumstances that you forget about everything that God wants you to do through.